Well, um, it has been an unprecedented year. Crazy. With all the, the... The stuff? Yeah. It's unprecedented how many times we've actually heard the word unprecedented. <laughs> Our dream vacation was canceled. You got to keep the job you don't like. You know they can see you? But let me tell you all the no's, friends. Um, no going to restaurants, no movie theaters, no movie theater popcorn, no state parks, no going to athletic events, no church services, and no... Don't say it. Don't. Hey, kids! You've got to be more careful with the toilet paper! This is all we have! All the drive-by birthday parties, graduations, <laughs> baby showers. I will say this, I thought it was a little awkward throwing out that baby shower gift in the front yard. You weren't supposed to do that. It just feels like a wasted year. There, I said it, I said it. Yeah, there's, there's just all the time at home. <laughs> Boom! And all the time that we were made to spend together. Hey, honey! Honey! Leave me alone! All the heart to hearts. Mm. Goodness. Speaking of hearts, our son, Jason, right over there, said yes to Jesus. All right, that kitchen table. July 17th, 2020. You know, I guess it's not really wasted time because God didn't waste a moment of it. <laughs> I think I have the answer to what I'm thankful for. Yeah? Yeah. What is it? Everything. Hello, Hope family, and welcome to our online campus. Thank you for your flexibility during this time. Our decision to only host our online campus this week was made by prayer and consideration to what was best for our church family and our community. We'll let you know when our physical campus will be opening back up as soon as we know as well. But hey, it's November right? The month of thanks. And I'm so thankful for our technology and the fact that we still get to do church together this morning, even if we're not in the same physical location. So can you do me a favor? If you have not said hi to me yet in the chat, I would love to say hi to you. So go ahead, let me know right now. Say hey. And if it's your first time, don't be shy. We would love to get to know you a little bit more. Say hey. I'm new, or just say, hi, Pastor Amy. I would love to start a conversation with you. Speaking of thanks, we are excited to help prepare a Thanksgiving feast with our friends at Urban Outreach. We are in need of just three more cooked turkeys for this feast on November 24th. If you would like to provide a turkey, you can fill out a form that's gonna be dropped in the comments right now or you can just say turkey in the comments, or you can email hello at hopechapelglendale.com. Thank you for helping us love people. The youth are hosting a yard sale in efforts to raise money for Speed the Light and Convoy of Hope. Let's send it over to them so they can tell us all about how we can be a part of this event. Hi, my name is Sonia. Hi, my name is Edith. Hi, my name is Maria. Hi, my name is Juan, and we're raising money for Speed the Light. We're raising money for Speed the Light. And we're raising money for Speed the Light. And we're raising money for Speed of Light. Wait. Hi, my name is Cash, and I'm raising money for Speed the Light. Hi, my name is Haley, and we're raising money for Speed the Light. One person's trash is another person's treasure. At our yard sale, you can find fun family games like this one, Glory. And yes, if you are wondering, the pieces are all here. It's almost Christmas time. You can get your very own toilet seat cover here, right here, and it also doubles as a beret. I know you have been searching high and low for uh, me and Mark, the teacher. So we got one right here. 
looking for some awesome music, we have Risen here by Ron Campbell. Buy one for you and buy one for your friend. We're partnering with our friends at Convoy of Hope to help bring disaster relief to Honduras and Nicaragua because of the recent hurricanes. We're raising $1,000 for Seeds of Life. Come visit our yard sale Saturday, November 14th, 7.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Okay, those look like some pretty good finds and I'm sure there'll be plenty of other great treasures for everyone. So we hope to see you next Saturday in the church parking lot. Now, if it's been a little bit since you've joined our online campus, let me just remind you, our God is omnipresent, meaning he is everywhere. He's in your home. He is here right now with you. So I invite you to set aside distractions, listen, and participate in this morning's service with the anticipation of the Lord doing a new work in your heart today. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning, God, and we are just ready for a move of you. Lord, maybe uh, we're feeling discouraged this morning. Maybe we're feeling lonely, but God, you are so good to us. You are so faithful to us. And so, Lord, I pray for each and every person that's listening right now that they would feel your presence in a real and tangible way in this moment. Lord, we give you this morning. We give you the worship we're about to participate in. We give you the word that we're about to hear. Lord, and we ask that you would change our hearts so that we can go forth and make a difference in this world. We give this morning to you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Right, friends? Amen. Praise God. Good morning, church family. It is good to be in the presence of the Lord right now. You know, we serve a great God. We serve a good God. And we serve a mighty God. And there is no one like Him. He is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be exalted. So this morning, church, I want to invite you let us join together to lift up the name of Jesus wherever you are right now wherever you're you're watching right now wherever you're worshiping with us right now God our God is worthy our God is worthy to be exalted come on let's worship him in spirit and in truth come on let's sing it let praise be your weapon that silences the enemy let praise be your weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We see your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Song that comes the storm inside of me. Let 
freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise We'll see you break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall Oh, fear cannot survive We, we praise you The God who breaks us on our side Forever our voices to you for you alone are worthy God we praise you we honor you we bless your holy name God God in the midst of chaos we praise you in the midst of the storm we praise you in times of troubles we praise you Jesus God it doesn't matter what our situation looks like god what matters oh lord jesus that is that we we will give you praise we will bless your name because you are a faithful god you you never change you remain faithful you remain good god your love never fails jesus so this morning lord we give you praise we give you honor and we worship you with all of our hearts and we will not stop praising your name Jesus we will not hold back our praise to you God hallelujah I can't hold back my praise I gotta let it out I can't hold back my praise I gotta let it out I can't hold back my praise I gotta let it out I can't hold back my praise I gotta let it out I can't hold back my praise I gotta let it out I can't hold back my praise I gotta let it out I can't hold back my praise I gotta let it out I can't hold back my praise I gotta let it out I can't hold back
so much for your presence in this place. God, oh God, we thank you so much, Lord, for your presence. Thank you, God, that there is power in your name. There is victory in your name, Jesus. Thank you that you fight the battles for us, Lord. So this morning, Jesus, we're going to declare that the victory is ours because of you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to try you. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, oh I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus, yes. In every war he wages, he will win. That's right. I'm not backing down from any giant. Because I know how this story ends. Yes, I know, yes, I know.
praise this morning. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you so much, Lord, for the victory, O oh God. We are victorious through the blood of the Lamb. Through the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything that you have done in our lives, Lord Jesus. God, we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. In the mighty name of Jesus and every every sons and daughter of God, every sons and daughters of God will say amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus was an incredible teacher. So good he could make officers sent to arrest him forget why they even came and marvel at his words. One of Jesus' favorite teaching tools was the parable. A parable is a story, a story told about something Jesus' audience would have been immediately and intimately familiar with, something they could relate to and understand. But it was also a story told to illustrate a spiritual truth in a powerful manner. Jesus' parables were not just about communicating information, but they were designed to create light bulb moments, to create moments of impact that would elicit emotion and a response. Jesus told parables to force his hearers to come face to face with the truth so that they would have to either consciously reject it or be transformed by it. So let us come and sit at Jesus' feet and listen to his parables anew. Our prayer is that these stories not only teach us truth, but that Jesus' parables help transform us into the kind of followers of Jesus that he desires us to be. Good morning, Hope Chapel, and I just want to thank you for joining us as we worship together online and continue our series on the parables of Jesus. Today we want to examine a parable of Jesus that teaches a spiritual truth that might catch us as odd at first. <clears throat> when you were a kid, did your parents ever teach you that life isn't fair? When I was a kid, my parents did, and, and I always thought of it as a little bit odd, you know, because on the one hand, they tried to make life fair for my brothers and I, uh, you know, in terms of in how our household operated, but on the other hand, they wanted us to know that, that at yeah, times you're going to face things in life that, that aren't always fair to you. Uh, you know, and it's something that, that can rub us the wrong way as human beings. As human beings, we like things to be fair to us, or at least, you know, fair uh, when it benefits us. You know, if you go to a, a restaurant, you know, for me, I'm a big fan of, of chicken. You know, if I, go to a, if I go and I order my family a, a bucket of 10 piece chicken, uh, 10 pieces of chicken, and I only get nine pieces, I, I'm going to be a little upset. I'm going to say, this is unfair. I'm going to go to the counter and say, hey, I ordered 10. Can you give me that extra piece? You know, for you, you might be a chicken nugget person. You know, if you get, if you only get nine chicken nuggets, you might even count them and say, hey, I only got nine. But on the flip side, you know, if, if it's unfair to us, for our benefit, sometimes we don't mind so much, you know, that if, if we go and we get 11 pieces of chicken or you get that 11th chicken nugget, you're probably more like, hashtag blessed, life is great, you're posting about it on, you know, Facebook or Instagram. Uh, so, so we cannot mind when things are unfair to our advantage. Uh, but it's interesting to me to note that, that even when things are unfair to our advantage, we can still sometimes get a little envious or jealous or upset if we notice that, that others have it even better than us. You know, that if, if, if you get 11 chicken nuggets, but, you know, your brother got 12, you know, you might be upset again. And it's, it's just kind of interesting to me how, how that all pans out and how we can, we can get upset if we think things aren't fair to us or even if we think things are just better for somebody else. Well, the parable that we're going to examine today from God's Word is the parable of the workers in the vineyard. It's found in Matthew chapter 20. We're going to read it in a moment, verses 1 through 16. And this parable, I'm going to tell you up front, it actually teaches the fact that in the kingdom of heaven, things aren't always fair. Now you might, you might say, well, hold on a second. What do you mean by that? You know, isn't God a God of justice? And I would say, yes, God is completely just. But as we're, we're going to examine today, God is sometimes uh, unfair to our advantage and that we need to be able to operate in that same manner to others around us. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead, turn to Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Let's pray together before we dig into God's Word this morning. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would just speak to us through your Word this morning. 
May you cause it just to come alive as it came alive for Jesus' original audience. May this parable be one that, that is just a light bulb moment for us to help us understand how the values of the kingdom of heaven might be a little bit different than our values so that we can be transformed into the likeness of Jesus, so that our values can be transformed into your values, Jesus. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 1, reads as follows. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went out. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. So what's your initial reaction when you hear this parable? Uh, for many of us, it might be that, wow, this seems rather unfair. You know, when you, when you consider the Jewish workday started at 6 a.m., uh, you understand that these guys that are hired first, they work probably 12 hours. That was a typical Jewish workday. Those hired at the, the third hour would be like 9 a.m. You know, the sixth hour would be noon. The, the ninth hour would be 3 p.m. The eleventh hour would be 5 p.m. Those guys hired last basically were just showing up in time to help clean up. And yet they got hired, excuse me, yet they got paid the same amount as those guys that had worked 12 hours, worked the entire day. That seems rather unfair. And then Jesus tells this story to illustrate the kingdom of God. And we might be thinking to ourselves, what? Why would you tell that, Jesus? You're, you're maybe comparing the master of the house to, to God? You know, you're telling it to, to illustrate that God would, would be so unfair? Uh, we might have issues with that, but if we're honest, we... We might feel that same way in our lives at times. You know, I, I think many of us can, can go through hardships in life and just say, God, this feels unfair to me. You know, you might be someone who's, who's just struggling financially, that you're, you're trying to act with integrity at your job, you're working hard, you're paying tithes, you're trying to, to spend your money in a way that's honoring to the Lord, but you just can't seem to get ahead. Finances are always just so tight and difficult for you. And then you might look over at the person, uh, you know, sitting in the, the aisle next to you at church, in the pew next to you at church, and, and you might see God just blessing their socks off. And, and you might be thinking to yourself, God, why, why them and not me? You know, are they, are they better than me? Or, or you might even know that they're not living the way that they should, and yet they're the ones getting promotions at work or raises at work. You know, you might be, you might be a young adult. And you might be trying to pursue a, a, a relationship, pursue getting married, and you're trying to do it according to God's will. You know, you're living your life and you're, you're trying to stay pure and, and you're trying to find someone that, that just uh, would be a godly spouse, and yet you're just striking out when it comes to relationships. And then you see friends getting married and you might just be thinking, God, this, this feels unfair. Where's, where's the person that you have for me? You might be a, a young couple struggling with infertility. You might be trying to just build a family and your heart's desire is just to have children that you can raise in the ways of the Lord that you just want to share God's love with and, and, and just be the parent that, uh, that you know God would want you to be. 
And it just doesn't seem like that's in the cards for you. It doesn't seem like you're going to be able to have a family of your own. And you look over and you see, you see other people with lots of kids and all they do is complain, you know, about how their kids are acting. And you just say, God, this doesn't seem fair. Why would you bless them and not me? Well, if you've ever felt like God isn't fair, I would say that this parable is actually one that I think can bring hope and encouragement to you. So let's just take a moment and dig into it together. Let's examine it from the perspective of Jesus' original audience. Because I think when we do so, we're going to pick up on some spiritual truths that are going to bring us some hope and encouragement about God's goodness even in a, uh, that, that is even over and above fairness. So let's look, let's look at the context of this parable. Let's start by looking at the cultural context. For starters, uh, when we look at this parable, we, we see about this master, this owner of a vineyard, that's going to the marketplace to hire workers. I would just like to point to, out to you that, that Jesus' audience would have been very familiar with this concept. That those who were unemployed in, in biblical Israel, those who didn't have jobs, who didn't have steady work, uh, who, who didn't have maybe a social safety net, you know, to, to support them when they were unemployed, uh, they would go to the marketplace and just hope that someone would hire them for a job. It kind of reminds me back uh, when I first moved to Phoenix uh, in, in 2012, I remember like needing help with, with some construction projects at my house. And I remember our, our former pastor, Pastor Steve, said, oh yeah, just, just go to Home Depot, buy the supplies you need, and there's going to be guys that'll just, you know, hop in the back of your truck, hop in the back of your car, and they'll go with you. I, I haven't seen those guys lately, but I remember there'd always be these guys that were just desperate for work, and they would just hang out at Home Depot, hoping that someone could hire them. That's kind of what, like, what it was like for, for, for these people in ancient Israel in the marketplace, that they're, they're unemployed, they need work, uh, and they don't have a means of supporting themselves. And so they're just looking for the chance to be able to earn some money to provide for themselves. We see that the master of the house comes and he offers guys in this situation a denarius to come and work for him for the day. Now when we hear the, the, the money unit of a denarius, most of us probably don't know what that exactly means. You know, whenever I study uh, the currency of, of other cultures like, like ancient Israel, I'm always reminded of how blessed uh, we are to be uh, in a culture that, that money is simple to understand. You know, you either have dollars or cents, and it's a hundred cents to one dollar, and it's, it's easy to, to understand. You know, can you imagine if you, if you lived in maybe like 1800s uh, England, and you had like, like maybe you had someone offer you like three mites, two farthings, a shilling, a guinea, and a sovereign to, you know, to buy something from you, and you're like, what? what's the exchange rate? Like 24 mites to a farth, to a shilling, to a pit? Like, how would you even figure out how much money you had if you had all these different coins? That's kind of how it was in, in Roman times. And, and so as I studied, it was like hurting my brain to like figure out, well, how much is a denarius? You know, my, my study Bible said, well, it was a day's wage, but that was really based on the fact that that's how much these guys were getting paid, was that they were getting paid a denarius for their day's work. Then when I dug a little deeper, I actually discovered that, that Roman legionnaires, a, a profession that was paid quite well, um, they would get paid like 112 denarii a year. Uh, that actually, that pay got doubled by Julius Caesar to 225 when he removed the fact that they would no longer get their, their food and their lodging, their tents paid for. So Roman legionnaires made 225 denarii a year having to pay for all their own supplies, all their own equipment, right? So that's like 0.6 denarii a day. You know, a, a little over a half a denarius a day was the pay for a Roman soldier. Scholars estimate that, that uh, maybe a skilled laborer would be paid similarly to a soldier. An unskilled laborer might get paid like half of that for a daily wage. These guys were temp workers, right? So they would have been of the unskilled variety and they would have maybe even been willing to take less than the going rate. So for them to get offered a denarius for a day's work, like a full denarius, that would be like getting offered maybe, maybe double, three times, even four times as much as they would expect to get hired for a day's work. So even these guys that are getting hired at the beginning of the day, they are getting paid really well. Three, maybe four times as much as they might expect to get paid for a marketplace daily temp job. This is a huge blessing for them. So as we look at the cultural context, I think the story starts to come into focus for us. 
that we see that these individuals are guys who are desperate for work and this owner of the house is being incredibly generous with them uh, with the amount of pay that he's given them regardless of how many hours they work that day. I think when we take the next step and look at the situational context of where this story falls in Jesus' ministry, I think it's just going to finally bring it all the way into focus for us. You see, Jesus wasn't just teaching this parable, uh, this story in a vacuum. He's teaching it in response to situations that he's experiencing in his ministry. You see, just prior to, to teaching this parable, Jesus had encountered the rich young ruler, and he had taught about just the difficulty of the rich entering into the kingdom of heaven. He's just had his, his disciples kind of ask him, well, well, what's in it for us? You know, what are we going to receive because we have left so much for you? Immediately after this parable, Jesus experiences the, the questioning of, of the, the mother of, of Zebedee's sons, James and John, as she comes and just asks him for, for maybe special favors for her sons, that they would sit on his right and his left in his kingdom. And, and Jesus has to deal with, with envy that breaks out among the disciples about who, who's going to be the greatest or who wants to be the best. And he teaches, he teaches this truth that the greatest among you in the kingdom needs to be willing to serve others, needs to be willing to humble himself and put him below others. And in fact, this, this parable itself is bookended immediately before and after by, by almost identical statements of Jesus. You can find them in, in Matthew chapter 19, the final verse 30, and then Matthew chapter 20, the final verse of this parable, verse 16. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. So the last will be first and the first last. This is a, a powerful spiritual truth that Jesus reiterates over and over again in his ministry. We see Jesus teach the, the same truth in different words over in Matthew chapter 23, verse 12, where he says, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Uh, even in the same chapter of Scripture, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus has to deal with the mother of Zebedee's sons, James and John, coming to him and asking for, for special treatment for her two sons, for them to be uh, above the other disciples in his kingdom. And Jesus, Jesus, in response to this, in response to the jealousy that is arrive, arising and the division that's arising in his disciples because of this conflict, he calls the disciples to him in Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be, become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So I think the, the truth that should really come into focus for us is how different the values of the kingdom of heaven are for maybe the values of, of our world. That our world says, what's in it for me? We want things to be fair in the sense that, that we get what we deserve and if we feel like we're better than someone else, we feel like we should get more than someone else. But Jesus is trying to teach that, no, in the kingdom of God, God wants to be generous to us. God wants to bless us. God wants to be good to us, not based on our performance, but based on, on who God is. You know, that, that he wants us to not be so obsessed with, with comparing ourselves to others, of wanting more than others. Rather, he wants us to focus first on, on his kingdom, on saying, I want to see God's kingdom come. I want to see his goodness come in my life and in the lives of those around me. I want to see the community of believers, the church. I want to see the world, even those who don't know Jesus, I want to see them come to know Jesus so that we all can be blessed by God, that we all can receive his blessings for our lives. I think when we really understand the, the parable in this way, there's, there's some spiritual truths, there's some application that are just going to jump out to us. The first uh, uh, application or spiritual truth point that I, I would make to you this morning it's that God is not fair to us, but he is gracious and merciful to us. Sometimes we want what we think we deserve. But when it comes to God, I'm just going to be honest with you, church, we do not want what we deserve. You see, the Bible teaches us that each and every one of us, we, we don't deserve a relationship with God. In fact, we deserve death. We have all sinned. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages, the just rewards the fair result of our sin is to be separated from God's goodness because God is perfect and holy and good. In his presence, there can be no sin, no evil. And so when we sin, when we do wrong, 
the, the fair thing for God to do would be to remove His presence from us. To, to, to judge us as unworthy because we are unworthy. But God, God is merciful and gracious to us. God loves us even when we don't deserve it. I'm, I'm moved by Paul's description of, of God's love uh, and, and, and just how gracious and merciful he is in his own life. Uh, Paul writes in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13-17, through 17, he says, Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Because of God's mercy, we don't receive the punishment that we deserve. Because of God's grace, we receive blessing, and, and we receive love, and we receive a relationship with Him that we could never earn by being good enough. That God is, is merciful and gracious. He isn't fair. He is merciful and gracious to us. We talked about how, how at the, uh, during the parable that, that a denarius would have been just this, this awesome wage, you know, triple what they might have expected to receive. Well, I'll tell you what, church, God's gift of salvation uh, would be like, like something just so far above and greater than anything we could ever ask or imagine. I, I, if I were to maybe give a modern example or a modern parable, I would talk maybe about, about how, how employees at a startup company you know, we're, we're working incredibly hard and, and how some had worked for a year and then some for nine months and some six months and some three months. And, and when the company uh, uh, went public and had an IPO, all, the, all these employees got stock options, you know, and maybe every single one of them got stock options that was, ended up being worth, once the company went public, you know, $10 million. Now, now those who were hired last you know, receiving $10 million for three months of work, that would be an incredible, uh, incredible blessing. But you know what's also a blessing? Getting $10 million for a year's worth of work. That if you don't compare it to each, compare it to each other, right, it's a blessing for all of them. Uh, we as Christians need to recognize that God has blessed us with a gift that we can never earn. No amount of uh, uh, work or good deeds could ever earn. Salvation could ever earn God's blessing, God's love, a relationship with Him. God gives it to us not because we've earned it, but because of who He is, because He is a generous, gracious, loving God. The second spiritual truth and application point that I would share with you this morning is, is the fact that as Christians, we need to not play the comparison game. The fact of the matter is, if you start comparing your life to others, uh, one of two things are going to happen. First, it might lead to envy. Uh, it might lead to this, this just jealousy, this covetousness that's just going to rob your joy and, and lead to discontent. That or it's going to lead to arrogance and pride, something that's going to uh, uh, result maybe in the justification of sin or maybe even lead you into more sin. You know, if you have your Bibles, turn over to Galatians chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, where Paul tells the Galatians, If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. The fact of the matter is, if you play the comparison game, it can just rob you of joy and lead you just to so much discontent. I, I, here, here's an example. Let's say you're a mom, right? And let's say you have a great morning with your kids, that you get them all fed, you get them dressed, you get them to school on time, you remember to, to give each one a mask and a water bottle so that they're ready for school, and, and you're just feeling pretty good about yourself, right? That is a good morning. I, if I'm being honest, as a dad, uh, I'm lucky if I get like half of those things done when I'm the one being responsible. You know, I'm the, I'm the one who's like running home because I forgot to, to send masks with my kids and they're not allowed in the school building until they have them, you know? So you're, you're feeling good about yourself because you got all your kids ready on time. It was a good morning. But then you get home, right? And you log on to Facebook or Instagram and you see your, your friend, your neighbor down the street, your friend from church posting about their morning, you know? And so for their morning, they, they got all their kids ready. 
They drove a, a minivan that was nicer than your minivan. You know, they had their kids with a, a homemade lunch packed with, with organic, vegan, whatever, special snacks, you know. They, they made a special craft. Their, their kids' masks are like uh, homemade, like way nicer than the, the ones that your kids are wearing. And, and you just start feeling terrible about yourself. Like, oh, I'm such a bad mom, right? You know, like, you don't play that comparison game. You did a good job. You know, take pride in your own actions that you did well. Maybe you're a guy and you just, you just have been blessed recently uh, with, with maybe a, a bonus at work and you, you, go, you go out to the store and you, you, know, you buy yourself a, a, a nice big screen TV and you're so thrilled that you can watch sports, you can watch movies and it just looks awesome, right? But then you go over to your friend's house and you discover, oh, the TV that they just bought is like, it's like 20 inches bigger than the TV that you bought. And they didn't just get a TV, they got like the surround sound system and they got the custom electric recliners and their, their setup is just so much nicer than yours. And so while a second ago you were thrilled and saying, oh, I'm so blessed, now you're feeling like miserable, like ah, my setup, my system's so much worse than somebody else's. You know, when we, when we play this, this comparison game, we will, we, it'll just lead to covetousness, it'll lead to envy, it'll lead to discontent, that things that we should feel really good about, that we should feel blessed about, we'll be unhappy and even angry about just because we see someone else might have things a little bit better. On the flip side, if we play the comparison game from a position of arrogance, uh, comparing ourselves to others, thinking that we're better than, he, we're better than we are simply because we're not as bad as others, uh, it can lead to all kinds of just sin uh, in our lives. You know, let's say you're a teenager and, and you see how your friends maybe lie to their parents, that they'll, they'll just tell bold-faced lies, they'll deny things that they've done, they'll lie about where they've been uh, to avoid getting in trouble. And, and so you think about yourself, well, I'm pretty good. I, I tell my parents the truth most of the time. Uh, if I lie to my parents, it's just a little lie. It's a white lie. Maybe it's a, just a small lie of a mission to avoid getting in trouble. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't like a, a, a bold lie. It wasn't a complete lie. And, and you'll, you'll justify what you know is wrong, justify not telling the truth, because you think, oh, well, at least I'm not as bad as someone else. You know, let's say, you know, let's say you're a, you're a guy and you're, um, your marriage is struggling and you know a, a big part of it is because you're not being faithful to your, your spouse in terms of just your heart and your lust because you have a pornography addiction. But you think to yourself, well, I'm not, I'm not actually cheating on my wife like, like I know this other guy at work that he's doing. Uh, or my, my addiction isn't as bad as, as this other guy who just uses it all the time. You know, and the, you'll, you'll justify or you won't deal with that sin in your life because you don't think it's as bad of a sin as somebody else. And if you think that it's okay that you can handle sinning at this level because you're not as bad or not sinning as much as someone else. The fact of the matter is, God wants us to examine our own lives, to judge our own lives, to say, I can take pride in the things that I've done that are good and not have to worry about if I'm uh, performing as well as somebody else or that I need to uh, repent of the things that I've done that are wrong without trying to justify it because I'm not as bad as someone else. That each one needs to test their own actions, not compare ourselves to someone else because it's just going to get things twisted. That we need to be able to be happy with what we have without being covetous. We need to be able to, to repent and, and, and deal with the sin in our lives without justification based on other people being more wrong. That we just need to test our own actions and not play the comparison game. The last spiritual truth and application point that I share with you this morning is that we as Christians need to seek riches and greatness according to the values of the kingdom of heaven as modeled by Jesus Christ. You see, the truth is that our world understands riches, our world understands greatness in a way that is contradictory to the kingdom of heaven. I think that's part of the reason why Jesus told a parable that on the one hand will strike us as so, so odd at first because he's just trying to shake us out of our earthly way of thinking and start thinking according to the values of the kingdom of God. And these are, these are modeled by Jesus himself. You know, if you turn into in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, verses 3 through 8, Paul writes to the Philippians, 
Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus is our example for greatness. He is our example for seeking not earthly riches, but heavenly riches. You know, when Jesus stepped onto our world, he didn't just look out for himself. You know, he chose to serve others. He humbled himself to meet us where we're at so that he could lift us up. He took the punishment that we deserve so that we could be uh, uh, reconciled to God. We could be lifted up to have a relationship with God. You know, for, for us, we, don't, we need to not be so concerned with, with the greatness being about being better than others. For us, greatness is about building the kingdom of God, seeing others come to know Jesus, seeing others be lifted up from the mire, from the, uh, uh, the pit of their sin, and being reconciled to the Lord. You know, does that mean that we don't focus on, on, on trying to do well ourselves? No, not at all. But, but the fact of the matter is, for a Christian, greatness is not about fame, it's not about recognition. It's about seeing God's will done in our lives and in the lives of those around us. It's about seeking the advancement and the fame of, of God's kingdom, that Jesus would be made famous in us, not about ourselves. Does it mean, uh, when we talk about riches, does it mean that, that we should not be concerned with, with getting paid a fair wage at work? No, that's, that's not what this parable is addressing at all. But the fact of the matter is, if we're seeking heavenly riches first, there are going to be times where we might, we might take a job that pays a little less because we feel God calling us to that career field. There might be times where, where we might not maximize uh, 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 the return on our, inve our, our investment because we feel God calling us to give generously to missions or to, to a cause that advances His kingdom. That our, our idea of what Wealth is our idea of what greatness is, is not going to be the way this world views wealth and greatness. It's going to be heavenly wealth, heavenly greatness. Jesus is our model for how we need to seek these things. So I just want to close this morning by doing two things. First, I just want to invite, if you are tuning in and you don't know Jesus, if you haven't accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, I would just want to invite you to join us as workers in the vineyard. You know, I mentioned it earlier in this sermon about how, how God's gift of salvation is something that we can never earn on our own. We don't work in the vineyard to earn salvation. But because of who God is, He has a gift that He wants to give you. And it's, it's a relationship with Him. It's new life in Him. It's eternal life in Him, an abundant life lived according to, to His kingdom, the values of His kingdom, uh, led by His Spirit to walk in the path that He has for you. And that if you're willing to accept that new life in Jesus, God's going to save you from every sin. He's going to forgive you of every mistake you've ever made. And He's going to uh, help you have a new life from the inside out, a life for eternity with Him. That if you're willing to, to join us as workers in the vineyard, I would just say we're, we're not going to be envious like the workers in this story. Uh, it doesn't matter if, 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 if someone's been serving Jesus uh, since they were a child or if someone comes to Jesus uh, in the 11th hour at the end of their life. Uh, we're going to welcome you. God, Jesus is going to welcome you into his kingdom. So I would just invite you this morning, if you don't know Jesus and you would just join us as workers as part of his kingdom, I would invite you just to pray with me here in a moment and accept Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life. For those of you who are Christians, that you're already in the, the vineyard of God's kingdom working, I would just challenge you this morning to use Jesus as your model for how to achieve greatness and riches in the kingdom of heaven. That you wouldn't play the comparison game saying, oh, I'm doing well because I'm doing better than others, or, or you wouldn't feel hard done to because you might see someone else receiving more than you, but you would just recognize the fact that God has blessed you immensely 
first and foremost with himself. That he has loved you, he has forgiven you of every sin, and he has given you a relationship with him, a blessing that, that we could never earn on our own. And that from that we would just seek, seek his kingdom, his righteousness, seek the advancement of, of his will in our lives, knowing that that's what's going to be best for us anyways. That's what's going to lead to the greatest lasting joy in our lives, is just seeing God use us to love him and love those around us, to build his kingdom in our lives and through our lives. So would you just pray with me this morning? Uh, whether you're, you're wanting to accept Jesus or whether you're wanting to, to, just to model your life after Jesus, would you just pray with me this morning? Jesus, I thank you for your mercy that you were willing to step into our world to give your life as a sacrifice for our sins. God, that we don't get what we deserve. We don't receive the punishment that we deserve. And so Jesus, I... I declare this morning with all who are willing to declare with me that we accept that sacrifice that you made on our behalf. We accept you as our Lord and Savior. And Jesus, I just ask that you would help us live according to your kingdom values. Live according to the example that you gave us. Live the lives that you have for us. Where we don't seek a type of greatness that tries to be better than others but we see greatness according to your kingdom that would just uplift others as well. That we would just seek to be the people that you have called and created us to be, people that love you with everything that we have and that love those around us. God, help us. Help us to live for you and your kingdom. Help us to not compare ourselves to others, either in envy or in arrogance. And help us just to live for you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray this morning. Amen. Would you join with me as we just worship the Lord together in one final song?
Yes, Lord, you're worthy. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. for that word, Pastor Eric. Can we do this? Hope family, can we do this? Can we go and live this out? Let's be Jesus with skin on to those around us. Let's serve without asking for anything in return. Let's look for the riches of heaven instead of the riches of this earth. Let's do it this week, Hope family. Let's love God, love people, and spread hope. We love you. Thank you for tuning in with us this morning as we had an opportunity just to gather together. 
We're praying for you. We're believing that God is on a move in Hope Chapel, whether we're in a physical building or we're all over the place. God is doing what he desires to do within us. So have a great and blessed week, and we will see you all later.